Hello and welcome to the MB Om podcast, where you will learn to master the business of yoga with guests from around the world who have experienced becoming successful yoga teachers, studio owners, and much more. Now, here's your host, Amanda Kingsmith. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of the MBOM podcast. As usual, I'm super excited for today's episode. Um, I have a guest whose name is Andrew Measley, and Andrew is a Sattva yoga teacher who's based out of Edmonton, Alberta. And he was actually somebody who was recommended to me by a listener to connect with. So after receiving that email, I reached out to him and I was really grateful that he wrote back to me and said that he would love to come on the show. And Andrew is a full-time yoga teacher. He teaches at the Sattva School of Yoga in Edmonton. He runs workshops and retreats and teaches classes within his community. And so the topic of today's episode is teaching sustainably. So it's something that we touch on on a lot of the episodes is how you know, this concept of teaching 20 to 25 yoga classes a week just isn't really sustainable in the long run. Um, it doesn't really work for making enough money to be livable. Um, it's really hard in terms of your energy levels. And Andrew has found a really good balance with teaching within the studio atmosphere, as well as having his own unique offerings. And so he tells me about his journey, becoming a yoga teacher, how he got into yoga, and then how ultimately he's sort of found this sustainable way to live off of being a full-time yoga teacher, which is pretty amazing. So for anyone who's out there who is new to the teaching atmosphere or has been teaching for a while and is feeling burnt out or feels like they need to change, this episode will definitely be super informative for you. And just as a heads up before you dig into the episode, Andrew and I did have a little bit of audio issue. Um, he was such a trooper through it. I don't know whose internet it was. We were, you know, both in Alberta, only a couple hours apart from each other, but Skype continued to crap out on us. We tried video, we tried just audio, and I eventually just called him on his phone from Skype. So please be patient with the audio. I know that it's never ideal when you're listening to something in your car, your headphones to have audio that's not perfect, but it is the reality of getting guests from all over the world, being able to talk on the podcast. And Andrew has tons of value bombs within the show. So hopefully those are better than the audio troubles that we had. Uh, So without further ado, here's Andrew. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming, taking the time to come on the podcast. It's super cool to have you here all the way from Edmonton. My pleasure. Um, did you want to start by telling me a little bit about how you got into yoga? Oh man, that's a really it's kind of a long story because uh, my first practice, I used to teach martial arts. I, I practiced Kung Fu from like age six to my mid twenties. And then I sort of veered off it and, uh, <clears throat> Before I was teaching yoga, I was really involved in the music and film industry. So I was uh, recording and I was touring with my band, but I was also uh, filming a sitcom. At, at the time that I quit all that, I was filming a sitcom in Toronto. So I had gone away from, from my martial arts. And so the reason why I got back into yoga was sort of a, a way to uh, to reconnect with my body or reconnect with my, you know, uh, get I thought get in shape for uh, – to re-enter my Kung Fu practice. But I pretty much the first class that I took, I recognized right away that, that it was this practice that I was actually always attempting to connect with, even when I was teaching Kung Fu or when I was practicing Kung Fu. So that's how I got into it. I sort of got into practicing yoga because I found myself in a, in a place where I was super, super busy pursuing all the things that I wanted to pursue and sort of having success with it. But I found myself completely unhappy with it so it didn't really make sense to me so i sort of quit everything in pursuit of something better and i didn't know it was going to be yoga i started practicing yoga and i recognized right away that's exactly what i wanted to do i uh gave away all my belongings including my car and i went to india wow (laughs) yeah and i took a training there that it wasn't necessarily a training that i was going to continue with but it's how i started And then I met my teacher around the same time that I actually went to India, but I had already committed to to do this training in India. And um, yeah, so then I met my teacher, Ramin, and I started practicing with him and I've been with him for close to a decade now. 
Okay, cool. So you, um, what style did you do your original teacher training in? I did Moksha. Okay. And do you still, because yeah. you teach at a Moksha studio in... I Edmonton. don't anymore, no. Okay. I, I, is that, what, does it say that on my website? I think so. <laughs> okay, thanks. I'm going to have to go back and fix that. I can be more on top of that website. Um, yeah, and the, and the other thing that I reason, actually, one of the reasons I also got into uh, into yoga is because I had actually gotten diagnosed with Crohn's disease when I was about 20, 22, 23 years old, and I had a really, really rough bout with that. Yeah. So I started, so the, the, that's the reason why I wanted to get back to martial arts, because I, I recognized what the Qigong training and could do, or prana training could do for the body and for the state of the mind. So that, that was the original, that was the original, uh, I think reason that inspired me to actually start uh, doing something with my body was for healing physically, but also mentally. Yeah. That's amazing. And you were just yeah. driven to teach because you had such a powerful, like ex- positive experience was, with yoga. Well, it was one of those things where I remember like practicing and recognizing that I actually wanted to do this for the rest of my life and I wanted to devote all my time to it, but I, went, I wasn't sure how I was going to do it. And then I it just made sense that I would take a training to try and teach it and just be around it all the time. So that's kind of why I did it. Um, it's not necessarily the reason why how I think people should go about it. I don't think you should start practicing yoga with the intention to teach it mm-hmm. or to open up a studio mm-hmm. or to make it as a business. That's not necessarily the best motivation to to practice, I don't think. It is one, though, and it, it kind of worked for me. But I wish that I've – sometimes I wish that I would have uh, – held off a little bit longer before I started teaching. But but I think that because I had many years of teaching Kung Fu, there was a, there was a strong connect right away with it, with how to teach and be in front of people and really convey uh, this, this body-mind practice, right? Mm-hmm. And then later on, much later on, it became really – I mean, I, I think I was teaching yoga for – years before I could ever consider myself really a teacher. And I don't even know if I consider myself a teacher. I have way too much respect for, for the yoga practice to call myself a teacher. I just mm-hmm. try to share what I, what I, what I've come across, you know? Yeah. Definitely. And my experience. Yeah. It's kind of interesting to hear that you don't like definitely resonate with the word teacher. Is there something that you prefer? Cause I know I've encountered lots of people who prefer like educator or like something around movements or like something yeah, that's not necessarily I, teacher. I don't know what that is because I don't consider myself an instructor. I don't consider myself an educator. I consider myself a practitioner teaching the practice, cool. but I don't know any. Yeah. I mean, I anger said it the best when he said, uh, you know, he will called an advanced teacher and he said, I'm not an advanced teacher. I'm an advanced practitioner. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. So the, I like that. Because, I mean, somebody else might call me a teacher, and of course I teach yoga, and I guess I am a teacher, but in your head, you always want, I think myself, I want to consider myself always a practitioner. Right. Right. Maybe, and- maybe 102. <laughs> I think, too, it's such an important concept about the idea of teaching yoga is that your practice is such a huge part of that. Yeah, it's the well. You know, you can't. Uh, it has to be, in my opinion, at the forefront of of whatever it is that you're doing, not just teaching. <laughs> right? I mean, if you're practicing yoga, if you're real devoted to the practice, it it's at the forefront of everything that you do. Right. For me, it does. It's my grounding. You know, it's uh, it, it it influences my relationships. It influences uh, my discipline. It influences my work. It really, it really also influences in my ability to stay inspired because I see that often. I see a lot of people come into the practice, start teaching, stop practicing and just lose their inspiration. And that's, that's not unfortunate, nor is it good nor bad. It is what it is. I think everybody learns differently, you know, and if you stick with the practice, the, your path will teach you that you have to practice in order to teach. Yeah. Yeah. I would a hundred percent agree with that. And I know that it's, I think it's something that I've heard so much like in my progression as a practitioner and as a teacher and throughout the podcast is like 
the biggest lesson is that you need to continue your practice. You need to continue learning from other teachers. You need to self practice and feel what things feel like in your own body. And that you really can't teach well if you're not practicing what you're preaching. Absolutely. And I think the practice should evolve 100%. You know, for me, it started really physical, but you know, and it's still obviously a physical practice, but a lot of, a lot of schools I find are not actually teaching the seat. You know, they're not really taking the time to sit down, do the pranayama and do the meditation practices. And I thought about that quite a while. I thought, I thought, why is that? And I think that maybe it's because if you're going to make it mainstream, you got to make it first accessible, the practice, right? Um, if you look at the body, the body sort of, you know, about the koshas, of course, right? The mm-hmm. sheaths. Yeah. <laughs> The body has koshas, and, and the first one that we usually tend to connect with in the practice is the physical, right? But if we can think of ourselves as a body, we can also almost think of our community or our global community as a body as well. So the first layer that you're going to hit with the yoga practice is the physical layer, where you start from a very, very uh, external connection to your practice, and then you go deeper and deeper and deeper. And I feel like as a community, that's happening as well. You know, at first when I started practicing, everybody was really, really strong to the strong vinyasa practices. But now, even if you go to like Wanderlust or you, you're looking at studios, people are really taking on the pranayama meditation practices. And I find that to be really, really inspiring because that is truly what's going to start to make the change. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. That's really cool to see in like Western society. Oh, yeah. I mean, even like, I think it's like the fifth or fifth year of Wanderlust or whatever not, I, I went there the first year and and my teacher was teaching a meditation class and he only got to teach like one meditation class and it wasn't very, actually it was okay, but it wasn't like super busy. And now this year it's like I got invited, I taught seven meditation cl- uh, talks and meditation classes and they're all sold out. And that just goes to say like people are really, really resp- uh, are grounding into that practice and that's that's really great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. That's It's amazing that other people are seeing that there's more than just the physical side of yoga because it's, it's so common that people come to yoga because of an injury or because, you know, somebody else has recommended it. It's a great way to like stretch or relax or get strong or whatever it is. And then they come and they find out that there's so much more to it. I remember, yeah, for sure. I remember years ago, a lady I was asking class, so so why is it that you want to practice yoga? What what's your intention for actually coming into this practice in the first place? And this lady's like, Well, to be honest, I just wanted to get a nice ass. <laughs> and I'm like I'm like, Well, is it that or you just want to change your relationship to your ass? <laughs> you can actually change your ass. But I thought it was kind of funny because it's true. It's like we think that we go into this practice for, for some reason, but it, it really, really becomes clear that's not why. I think, I think that a lot of what this practice is, it's a polishing of, of your intention. You know, you come into a, into a practice and you set your intentions and then you fast forward a year or two and then you re- recognize that the intention that you have now is much, much more different than it was before. And that continues on and continues on. And I really feel like that's what it is. The practice is a polishing of the reason why you practice in the first place as you mature and as you self-realize. And I think that maybe at some point we're all having the exact same same intention at the very, very ending of that polishing process. Yeah, that's a cool thing to think about. Do you know what I mean? It's like we're here to evolve. We're here to learn. We're here to uh, move forward uh, consciousness. And I think that as you practice and you mature in the practice, that the reason – and this might sound a little too esoteric, but the reason why you practice can probably be very tied into the reason why you chose to be embodied. Yeah, that's an interesting thing to think about. Yeah, I think so. If you if you if you can contemplate on this idea of reincarnation and the the and the soul's evolution. Yeah, it's it's interesting to think about because it's like not a tangible thing to like grab onto because it's like not something that we know as a certainty, (laughs) but it's such an interesting thing to contemplate as a possibility. Yeah. But I think that what we don't know is much larger than what we do know. 
Oh yeah, and, definitely. Like you just need to look up to the sky and look at the stars to realize how much you really don't know. Yeah. And if you can actually get comfortable with that idea of not knowing, that's an amazing, amazing gift, especially if you're a teacher of yoga or if you've been practicing for quite some time, you can start getting into this place where you think, you know, you know, you think, you know, so you stop having that, that mind, that, that eager and hungry mind of a beginner that is just willing to listen. And if you can like, as a mature practitioner, keep just embracing this idea that you don't know, I think that's an amazing gift to give yourself. Yeah. I think that that's an amazing thing in like your yoga practice and especially in teaching when you can come from a place of, I don't know everything, or I might learn something from this person or this class or this practice. If you, in, even like in, if you go into your practice and you go into your meditation and you go into your Shavasana, this idea of, I don't know, it, it's, it's this, it's the same idea of fully, fully surrendering to what is right without this, uh, without this clout that we sometimes put of what we want the what is to be or what we expect it to be, but actually just leave it to be an experience. Mm -hmm. I, I often try to come back to this idea of not knowing because it's, it brings me a lot of comfort, to be honest, to, to be okay with not knowing. Yeah. It brings me a lot of comfort. That's, that's really cool to hear because I think that most people experience something that's like pretty opposite from that, where when they start thinking about the unknown, they feel very uncomfortable. Yeah, well, that's one of the biggest hurdles that we are dealing with when our practice is fear. You know, it's the greatest separator. And, and I think if your practice is not challenging that, if it's not actually challenging your fears, then you need to maybe question that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Do you think that fear is something that the practice really helps us overcome or do you think it's like we're more like head on with it or what are your thoughts sort of on that concept? Well, I wonder if it's an overcoming or simply a realizing, you know, like for example, for example, a headstand, you fear it and you tense up and you only fear it because you actually don't, you've never experienced alignment. Mm -hmm. The minute you feel mm -hmm. you space alignment, you realize that all of that fear was nothing more than just something in your head of the unknown or of your expectation, or you are feeling the fall that you hadn't even had yet. So it's all really in your head and it's a story that we create. But the moment that you actually stack the body and you get into that center point where it's actually completely uh, easy and frictionless, you come to the realization, oh, that fear doesn't exist. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool to think about. Um, a couple of years ago, I was at Wanderlust and I can't remember whose class I was in. Um, it was somebody amazing though. It was, I can't remember who it was, but they were saying how there was somebody who had never practiced yoga, who decided to come to this yoga festival and this person was just very like open to learning and curious about the practice and curious about like the physical movements and everyone was going into an advanced arm balance. I can't remember what it was, uh, or not everybody, a couple people were and this girl was like, how do I do this? And the woman's like, just like lift up, draw up here, engage through this and go into it. And she just like easily went into this thing that other people were like, I've spent years trying to do it and I can't do it. And it was this whole concept of like, she didn't have, it was just a possibility for her. It wasn't something to be scared of. It wasn't like, oh, this is really hard. Oh, only people who are really good can do this. It was just a complete possibility. And she just went into it very easily. That's awesome. I, I remember when I started years ago trying to uh, get up into handstand and, um, it's kind of a little bit different off topic, but kind of similar at the same. I used to spend a lot of time jumping up, jumping up, and just sometimes landing it, sometimes not landing it. And just, you know, I'm sure if you've ever practiced hands, then you've probably been there as well. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I, <clears throat> my teacher came up to me one day and said, like, okay, you want to practice? I'm like, sure. Okay, for the next six months, you're only allowed to practice, you're only allowed to do one handstand a day, whether you land it or don't land it. Within a week, I was landing it. 
And it was this idea of what I took from that is that he was teaching me how to do it as opposed to try to do it. You can get into this trying mode of trying to do things where you're almost giving yourself permission to not actually do it fully or fully, fully do it. And whether I was landing it, coming up or falling down, I was doing it. And that's what it looked like when I was doing it. It was just that it changed the, I changed the word from trying to do by doing it once a day. And then, and I've taken, and I've given that practice to a couple people. And so I, I found that, I found it very empowering to, to, to get that lesson of doing it because you can apply it to so many other things. I know so many people that are always trying, 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 trying. And I really find that sometimes to be such a exhausting word to use. It's much easier to just to do it and fail than to try and fail. Yeah, definitely. I agree with that. I love that idea of practicing handstand that way or a different pose that's really challenging. Makes me think of, I saw Gabor Mate speak a couple of years ago. Have you heard of him before? Of course, yeah. Yeah. And he did an example. He was speaking in Calgary. He did an example where he got a woman and he was like, could you try and stand up? And so she's like, okay. So she stands up and she's <laughs> like, and he's like, you didn't try, you did it. And he's like, now try and sit down. And she was like, so confused by this. And then she sits down and he's like, you didn't try, you did it. There is no, like, it's exactly what Yoda says in Star Wars. It's like, there is no try. There's do or do not. Exactly. Exactly. It's funny when you start to change the way that you just use your words with yourself. It really, really changes uh, how you commit to, to your life, how you commit to being present with with what is it you want to do. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think that that's so important to you from like this idea of becoming a teacher and becoming like the best version of yourself as a teacher and where you want to go with your career is really like setting these possibilities for yourself instead of like, I can't do this. I'm never going to do this because then it's not going to happen if you can't believe in yourself. Or you're just trying to be what you're not. Right. You know, I come across that with uh, like people that are starting to teach right away and they're so nervous, especially when they, you know, when someone that has come like myself who has been teaching for quite some time or somebody else who has been teaching for a little bit longer, they come to their class and they get super nervous because they feel like they have to sort of say the right things beyond themselves to impress this person or to like, live up to whatever, you know what I mean? As opposed to just teaching what you know, everybody's got something to teach. Everybody's got a really, really unique perspective. And I think if you can just, whether you've been practicing for a week or sorry, teaching for a week or te teaching for you for years, if you can just stick to that, you'll always have something to offer. And, and I think that doing that will, will help a new teacher to also just get over that hump, that fear of, of getting in front of, of an audience for lack of a better word. Yeah. I love that piece of advice because I know there's a lot of like newer teachers that are listening to the podcast and I know like having come out of teacher training a couple, I guess like a year and a half ago, it was like, it's like, Oh, I know all these good teachers. Like, how do I be like them? And then this realization that it's like, I'm never going to be like them because I'm not them. I'm me. And that's <clears throat> like, that's perfect. And you've got something to share uniquely to you because you have your own set of eyes. You have your own set of experience. You have your own set of sensations. Go with that, man. Go with that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And so after you started teaching, um, sort of what was the evolution of your career? Like to where you've gotten to now? Oh man, it's quite the trip. You ready for it? I'm ready. So, okay. So when I got back from India, I, uh, I got a call from the founder of, uh, of Moksha Yoga and he offered me a position to the studio that was in PEI in Prince Edward Island. Oh, wow. Yeah. I was like, and I was brand new. And I was super eager. I'm like, yeah, let's go. So I went out to PEI. Long story short, I talked to her for, for a year and I was doing this cleanse and I was getting really sick. Not this, not because of the cleanse, but I was getting really, my Crohn's was really acting up. And I ended up uh, having an emergency procedure when I was in PEI. So I, I actually lost my large bowel. And I was in the hospital for months there. And I remember 
like I had tubes in my throat and I had a respirator. Like I was, I was in really rough shape for, for a few months in the hospital. And, uh, and I remember having this vision when I was in the hospital that I was going to ride my motorcycle. I, I ride motorcycles. I was going to ride my motorcycle across Canada doing a, uh, an awareness campaign for intestinal diseases and teaching yoga. Wow. Yeah. So I told this to the doctors and they're like, well, we don't think that we can let you. I'm like, well, I wasn't really asking for your permission. This is what I got to do. So my, my rehab process that I gave myself was sort of backwards because usually when you go into a practice of yoga, you go asana, pranayama and meditation. But when you can't move, I had to do everything in, in backwards. My practice started with uh, meditation. And then when I, when I could, I started working with pranayama techniques. And then when I could, I started walking again. And eventually I started teaching again. And I, I actually taught my first class when I was still hospitalized because they had given me a day pass. It was like two days before I was going to get released from the hospital. They gave me a, a day pass and I went to the moksha there and I taught this class and it was, I mean, it's, it's what I needed to do, but for the whole class, I thought I was going to pass out because I had no strength. My, my, my voice wasn't even fully back yet. So then I, I, uh, flew to Edmonton and I gave myself about two months to, to rehab myself. And this is like, like I had surgery. Like I couldn't even, I wasn't even allowed to like pick up a bag because I don't know, like, you know, women that have a C-session, if they pick, like they're not allowed to pick up anything heavy for a long time because right. of the stitches. Yeah. So it's like the same thing. So for two months, I started working slowly with my practice and then I did it. I, I, I shipped my motorcycle at the PI, I flew down and I rode across Canada for four months teaching yoga. I taught like 80 classes, did events. It was one of the most amazing experiences that I, that I, that I've done. And, um, in that, I got to really, really practice this idea of presence, of allowing yourself to actually listen to life, to actually have trust that the journey itself is going to provide for you. And that kept getting proven to me in so many ways, like so, so many ways that I could go on and go on and go on where I would need something and it would just happen. And it became like a practice to do that and to actually just trust, trust that that the practice trust that your journey was going to provide for you. And, and it did. So I did that. And then that sort of started uh, my passion for, for traveling and teaching yoga. Cool. I came back to Edmonton and I started uh, practicing with Ramin at the Sattva school of yoga. And then from then on, I just started uh, creating things like it's not easy when you come out as a new teacher, especially nowadays, it's really, this is the one piece of advice if you're listening and, and, and you want advice on on uh, starting to teach? Create, create something. That's what I've always done. I've had to create in order to get myself opportunities. And then suddenly somebody calls you for a podcast asking you about your business, which is mind blowing to me that you're calling me about business. <laughs> but but I can see it. You know, I, I've I've learned a lot through it because I've had to create my own opportunities. When I came back to uh, to Edmonton, I started. I started teaching at the, at the Sattva school of yoga and I was still kind of working part time because I had to, I wasn't making a living just teaching yoga, but then eventually I was able to. Um, and then I started to create, uh, opportunities for myself. One of the, the, the ones that I created for myself that, that I still actually had is alive and, and thriving today is called Sunday sessions. And my idea was to create a, at this time in Edmonton, there was nobody offering outdoor f classes or for free. And my idea was to have an outdoor class, but not just have an outdoor class. My idea was to have like the class of the week that everybody wanted to go to with like music and, and fun and have it for free for the cool. community. That's and also to have it access, accessible to people who couldn't afford to do yoga. And so I started doing this at, at the park, at Horlack Park. Um, you know, at first there was like maximum 10, 10 20 people. And then... Um, the reason, actually, the reason why I started that is because I was going to offer this uh, six. At that year, I did it at five a.m. I did a five a.m. Uh, class at the park, at Horlack Park for Solstice, and that's something that I've done every year too. The first year we had about one hundred and fifty people show up. 
And uh, this past year, we had over 1,500 people show up. So it just grew. Wow, that's and crazy. The, the Sunday session class, it started with 10 people, 20 people. Now, when we did it outdoor this year, on average, it was 150 to 200 people that would come. But we also do it at the set. So in the wintertime, we do it at the Sapa School of Yoga. And, and it's so much fun what we've, what we've created. We have a DJ, um, my buddy Luca, and then we have guest DJs come in. Uh, guest musicians come in and people are just super excited to come to this class because it almost feels like, um, <laughs> for me, it feels like what church should feel like just a, an awesome, fun celebration of community and spirituality. Yeah. Yeah. So that was one of the things that I did that I feel like really empowered me to, to create and to offer what I needed to offer or offer what I, what I felt people needed as well or wanted. And then from then on, I kind of kept doing that. I kept doing events and kept throwing them and having success with them because they'd always came from a place of actually not expecting anybody to show up. Um, and that kind of got ruined to me by Lululemon <laughs> because the first two years of the solstice, I didn't have any expectation and suddenly 150. Then the next year was like 400 people showed up. And then one of the managers of Lululemon asked me, so what's your goal this year? How many people do you want to have out? And I told her, I want to have these, this amount of people. And then, and then I just remember the amount of stress that I put on myself because I expected now to have that many amount of people. So I guess the, the advice would be is like, just create something and have no expectation. Just pour yourself in and do the best job you can have no expectation and just watch. Right. Cool. I love the idea of like having and setting tangible goals, but I also like the idea of like creating something and just being like, okay, I'm putting it out there and I'm going to do it if there's one person or 10 people or a hundred people and it's going to be great. Yeah. I, I, I work a little bit differently. I don't necessarily create ten. I, what I do is that I try to, my goals look more like, what do I want to, what do I want the thing to feel like? Right. That's kind of my goal. What do I want this thing to feel like? And that's how I set my intention. So like, for example, my intention for the Sunday sessions when I moved to Indora was I wanted to feel like the whole room was vibrating and hot and people were just like giving it all. And it translates into a, a packed room with that happening. Yeah. No, that's cool. I, I, like, I no, it no, it does. I like the idea of setting an intention and just being like, like this is my intention for this, as opposed mm -hmm. to setting this like expectation for how many people are going to show up. And I think it's also interesting when you take like money out of the mix too, and you're creating something. That's more. exactly it. Yeah. That was that was the other piece about the Sunday sessions being free. It's not just because it's free. It's exactly that the taking out the money both taking it and paying it, not even like for the patient pay, uh, paying, but also for the person taking the money. It takes that out of the equation as well. So all you're there for is the practice and community. And it makes the, the, the whole experience so much fun. So, so much fun. And, and healing too. Incredibly healing. I've had so many people just like write me emails, just thanking me for that opportunity to do that class because of what it's done for them, what it's done for them and their family. Because a lot of people want to come to yoga, but they can't afford to bring the whole family. Mm -hmm. So I have people that come in with their kids and they come in with the, with, yeah, with their kids and their spouses and they're all practicing together. Those kinds of things I never even thought about when I did it before, but you know, um, in retrospect, I, I think, I think it's a blessing. It's a blessing that I, that I had the opportunity to create that. Yeah, definitely. And I'd love if you could talk about sort of finding the balance between um, teaching more of like a karma style, like a free class versus making sure that you're making enough money to actually have like a sustainable career. Yeah. Well, I've noticed this year, like I had the thought of almost stopping the Sunday sessions this year, but I, but I didn't because there was free yoga now every night at the park and different people doing it. I'm like, okay. I did it because it wasn't being offered, but now I feel like it's being offered too much. And not that I'm saying, oh, it belongs to me, but I'm saying is that people are just going to go to the free classes. And then what happens to the studios? You know, not just my studio, not my studio, but all studios. Like it is unfortunately how we make our living. And, and I think people, 
yeah, I think there's a, there's a balance between karma and then sustainability. I do, I do the karma work because I, I, it's, it's part of my practice, not just the, not, not just the Sunday sessions, but other stuff as well as part of my service. Um, but I have no qualms as well as on doing my workshops and doing my retreats and charging good money for that because I do feel like the amount of hours that we put in, the amount of work that I do and what people get out of it is worth the money. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that you yeah. like phrase that really well, that there's like finding that it's okay to offer something that's for free for people who can't necessarily to bring their bring their entire family, but it's not like you're offering it free all the time. Exactly. And let's put it this way. I'd rather offer something for free than discount it. Okay. Yeah, I like that. I, I'd rather offer something for free if somebody can't afford it than discount it. And there's always ways of paying. You know, people don't have sometimes, you know, people have, I've traded people with services before. Like they'd help me with my vehicle or something like that. You know, that's great. You know, it's, it's, we're both getting something out of it and they're, and they're both of value, right? Like, um, unless you're sick and you're in a really shitty place mentally and, and all that kind of stuff, unless, unless, like those kinds of people, I say, just come practice. Don't let money, don't let anything be a, a deterrent for that. If you, if, you, if you don't have money, if you're actually going through a really hard time, come practice. But if you don't have money, but you have other things that you can offer, like cleaning the studio and all this stuff, I'd rather do that as well, you know, because I know for myself, I've always wanted to pay um, for any you know, any, any, like when I did my teacher training, I, I, I've always wanted to pay, even if like, if I had the opportunity to get it for free, I'd rather pay for it because I, f I feel for myself that if I pay for it, I'm actually going to invest myself more in it. Right. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree with that. That's, that's how, I, cause I, I noticed that as well as a lot of people get, you know, these, these things for free and it doesn't quite land the same for them. Mm -hmm. Others, Others not. I, I've also met other people who have gotten the opportunity for free scholarships and, and they've done really, really great things with it. But I, yeah, I think there's, there's always a way to, uh, to exchange that, that, that energy, right? Yeah. Yeah, Whether definitely. It's, so, it's, it's something I've thought about quite a bit because there's, there's a lot of, um, like karma or free classes within like Banff and Canmore just because it's really expensive to live. And I see the difference as both a practitioner and a teacher in the clientele that show up to the classes that are free and the ones that are paid for. And the only times I've ever had people like talk or laugh or giggle or like say something to their neighbor is teaching a class that's free. And mm -hmm. it, it's hard as a teacher because it's like, I'm like, this is a service that I'm providing for you. And I want you to experience how great yoga can make you feel. But it's also like there needs to be a respect level there where you respect the people around you and you respect absolutely. the space and you respect the teacher. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, uh, I think also once the, like when you have a strong community, the community teaches the brand new student. Uh, you know, when they go in, they sort of just feel what's happening and they follow suit. But I think it's a little bit harder when it's a brand new class and you're doing it for free. People don't know what the expectations are. Right, right. Or if the expectations haven't been set as to how mm -hmm. the like the space should be treated as well. But yeah, but people laugh in classes for the strangest reasons. And a lot of it is just nervousness, you know. Uh, I don't. I haven't, can't remember the last time I had people laugh in my class, other than because I, I tell a lot of jokes in my classes. Right. Yeah. I tell a lot of jokes, but I try to keep it really light because and and to be honest, it's a technique that I use because <laughs> the practices that we teach are quite intense. And when I feel the room getting super intense, I find that a little bit of humor can actually help the practitioner go a little bit deeper because it takes some of the some of the tension out. And I find that sometimes humor allows for that ten intensity to soften a little bit, to soften it a little bit and then allow people to just relax a little bit and go in some ways deeper into their practice. But it's a different kind of laughter, I guess. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think you know, it's such a good tactic to get people sort of like out of their heads and more into their bodies. Absolutely. And, uh, I find that sometimes in humor, you can actually express certain truths that 
convey really well too. Um, because I think it's only funny if it's true. Right. Yeah. No, that's a great point. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm curious, what are some of the biggest business lessons that you've learned over your career? Um, well, you're an entrepreneur and you're self-employed and, uh, you have to be driven if you want to, if you want to do other than teaching, uh, classes, because what I do know is that it's not sustainable to teach public classes and trying to make a decent living. I, that's in my experience anyways. Yeah. Um, not that you have to make a lot of money, but in my case, you know, I want to have a fiance. I want to get married. I want a family. You, you have to make more money than a bachelor. So I find that uh, it's very difficult for, for teachers to make uh, a good living um, teaching public classes. So you have to just stay on it and, and be creative and find ways in which you can offer uh, classes that will pay you more, whether it's in your community or whether it's private, whether it's workshops or whether it's, um, you know, retreats or whether it's you teaching yoga and having a job, you know, which is also great for some people to actually have a, a job that pays them so they can just be free to, to practice and teach what they want to teach. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that you do your own taxes. That's a really important one that a lot of uh, new teachers for the, get hit with on a continual basis because they don't plan for that. And I think sometimes even the practice itself attracts people that don't actually <laughs> are not super uh, on top of that. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, if you're starting to teach and you're starting to become more successful at it, you start to make more money to just be really mindful with that, finding a good accountant to help you with that. Um, what else? What else? You know, at the end of the day, it is a business, but it's a very, very unique business because it's also a spiritual practice. So there's a, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of things that you're going to learn on your own that no, nobody else can actually uh, really prepare you for it because of the situations that you, that you move into. And also because I think business models are changing seems like every year, you know, every year everybody's coming up with a new way of actually uh, having a business. And I think that's really exciting because it means that you can really create anything yourself. You have the internet, you have ways of promoting yourself. You have ways of, uh, accessing a, a large crowd that, that, that even 15 years ago, 10 years ago, we, we, we didn't. So I'm really excited to see what happens with new teachers, uh, younger teachers who come out and, and create, create a new way of actually sharing this practice. I don't think I have a, I've always had a lot of people ask me if I'm going to open up a studio or when I'm going to open up a studio. And I don't know if, you, I don't even know if that's the business model anymore right. to teach yoga, to open up yoga studios. I think for me, it's like, you know, the the platform that I like is doing retreats and doing trainings and going out to communities and putting on events. And yeah, I teach at yoga studios, but I don't I don't think that the world needs more yoga studios at this point. I feel like it's actually quite saturated. So I don't know what that looks like uh, in terms of uh, getting the practice out there, but I think that it's going to change. Yeah, I think that you're definitely I think that, right on that one. I think that as a one of the things that I observed is that actually I you become your own business. You become your own sort of uh, not studio, but you become your own brand. You become your own your own your own business. So I think that gives you a lot of freedom in some ways, in 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 that you can actually create. You can create the kind of retreat that you want to have, the kind of experience that you want to offer. And that's, that's, that's all I've ever done. I've always tried to offer something that inspires me and offer something that I feel people will walk away with feeling rejuvenated, inspired, and, and somewhat transformed. And I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen many times, you know, and, and, and it's not because obviously it's not because of me. All I ever did was just to organize something so that something could happen. 
you know, and then the magic happens through the practice. And that's the other thing that, I, that, that I learned is that, you know, you can package it, you can do all these things to make it look fancy, but really all it needs is a solid practice. And, and I've found that my retreats and the and trainings that I've done, I've actually tried to streamline a lot, streamline it, um, to not overly, overly saturated with information, just keep it super, super simple because all of the transformation is not going to happen in the words that you say or the fancy uh, ways that you put, uh, put it out there, but it's going to happen in the, in the individual. And you have a higher chance of affecting or having that person have an experience with something simple than, than something so overly complicated. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that those are all really, really good points that you made. I used to do my own sequences and do, you know, get super fancy with my sequences. And, and, and now it's like super simple, you know, and I think that in business, it's probably quite the same. As you learn, you don't create more. You I mean, you create more, but you make things a lot more simple so that it's more accessible for people. Right, right. And, and so it's, it's also easier for yourself you as can, well. Exactly. It's easier for yourself to, to, to offer it. You know, it create, the other thing that I learned is it's an incredible amount of work to put on things like retreats and workshops, especially if you're doing it by yourself. Um, but you have to, um, you have to gamble with it a little bit if you, if that's something that you want to do. Um, if it's trainings that you want to do, because the fact of the matter is, is that you're never really, really ready. You know, you're never really, really ready for anything. All you, all you can do is just meet the moment with the, with, uh, with the best that you have. And I, and and trust that being present and being um, in tune with your positive emotions is going to show you the how. And that's kind of all I've, ever, all I've done. It's just like <clears throat> kind of overreach, you know, go beyond my comfort zone and then just meet it and meet it. And then from there, just respond with it, respond with the moment, respond with the experience. And if you can do that honestly, and then fearlessly, there's a high chance that you're going to have a really, really successful uh, experience. Yeah, that's amazing. Thanks for sharing that. I just have one last question for you. And it comes from looking at your website sure. and being like, this website is really, really well done. How important do you think mm -hmm. having a website or somewhere like a base where people can find you is for a career? I wonder about that myself, like myself right now, I'm actually going to be in, I'm in the process of creating a different website. Cause I want to have something more interactive, um, with more, yeah, more interactive stuff. I think it's, I mean, you looked at it and you called me, right. So that, that says something, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think it's, I think it's, it's in, like if you're traveling and you're not in a studio and you want to create things that you can offer, I think it's important to have a website. And the thing is that now days you can create your own website just as good as that one better on your own. And it's really, there's stuff out there that can help you do that. You know, like Wix is an amazing, amazing platform where you can create the most beautiful websites for free. So it's out there and you can create that. And when, why not, you know, let people know what you're up to have something that like a, it's almost like a business card. It's really what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, People can see what you're up to. You can sell things on it. Uh, you can you can go as fast as you want. You can do blogs. You can do... I think it's important, but I don't think it's the most important. I just think it's important for because if you want to stay in touch with people, that's a good landing place for them. Yeah, that's kind of my thoughts on the same thing. So I was just curious what your thoughts were as well. Like I always find it interesting because there's a lot of industries where like you would definitely have a website for your business, but it seems like sometimes in the yoga industry, people think about themselves as employees of other people's businesses. And they're like, Oh, well, like my bio, my photos like on this studio page that I teach. And it's like, well, you teach at a bunch of different places and you are your own brand. You are your own entity. So you should have like something, something to represent that with. Yeah, I think at some point, if you keep working at it and if you keep offering the things that you want to offer, you're, that's going to mature out of you. 
that attitude of like you're going to see yourself as not somebody that people are hiring, although they are, but see yourself as somebody who has something to offer. Right. You know what I mean? It's yeah. a little bit of a different attitude of of saying, oh, I hope they hire me or saying, you know, I feel really confident what I have now to offer and I want to offer it at your studio. Which yeah. is different than saying, please, please hire me. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And that's just it's that. totally different. And you, and you can't really rush that. You know, you can't, you don't want to be also be cocky and, and <laughs> just treat yourself. And, and the, because that's never should be the attitude of like, oh, I'm so great. You should hire me because no, you just have to be humble, but also confident in, in, what, in the things that you know and, 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 and the realizations that you've had. And also, don't just teach at a studio to teach at a studio. It has, like, that's the other thing that I learned over time is that you have to really want to be there, you know? You have to line up with it, too. I've taught at studios and I've ta- stopped teaching at studios just be, not because they're not great studios. It's just it's, it didn't line up with how... I teach or, you know, my philosophy about what a studio should be. So, but I think that's, that's something that you define for yourself in your own way as you keep going, just like anything else in life. Right. Yeah, definitely. I think that if you've taken the step to teach yoga, it's because you don't, it's because you've chosen to not maybe go to the nine to five job. So you should really, really, Take on that 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 uh, lifestyle for yourself. You know, take on, explore as deep as you can that lifestyle for yourself. Amazing! Don't, don't... I love that. I love that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's a it's a really really great opportunity if you can if you can make a living teaching this, um, or you know, for the matter, it's a really great opportunity if you can make a living doing anything that you love. You know, whether it's yoga, whether it's music, or whether it's banking. You know, if that's what you love, if you have the opportunity to do what you love, it's an amazing, it's an amazing thing. So, let that be your your goal <laughs> to just really go into that lifestyle that you see yourself in, and don't don't stop halfway. Yeah, because... I think that that's incredible. That's like, I mean, that's what I want to do, and I, I'd love to see like more people doing that. I think the world would be a much better place if we all did the things that we love. There's... Exactly. And there's room for everybody. You know, I, there's such weird competition sometimes that I see in studios. And it's like, why are you afraid of like the studio open up there this and that, or afraid of them taking your business, create, make more practitioners, get more people involved in the practice. That's all you should. I think the more teachers, great, you know, I, but I think that you should go out there and try to find people that are not practicing and get, get them to do it the youth, you know, like Ryan Lear is doing the yoga for youth. That's an amazing thing. I and just got that email today. That. <laughs> I was talking about that with somebody last night. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. I love Ryan. He's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. He's super cool. Ryan, Ryan came to see me in the hospital when I was in PEI, which was really, really amazing. Yeah. That's incredible. It, it actually it blew my mind that he did that. And that's what, you know, love that guy. I don't get to see him often enough, but he's a great, great friend. Super cool. Um, so I'm curious um, where people can go yeah. to learn more about you. Well, I teach at the Sattva School of Yoga in Edmonton. I also have a website. It's uh, andrewmislayyoga.com. And I'm always offering retreats. Uh, I'm usually doing about three to four retreats a year. Uh, this year, next month, we're going to Sayulita, and then I'm off to, uh, I'm doing uh, two retreats in India in March. So I'm really stoked about that. The first one, I think it's full, but the second one is, uh, we just actually launched the second dates. And if anybody's interested in coming to that, it's going to be great. We're going to Northern India, to Varanasi, Rishikesh, Darsala, Agra. It's going to be really beautiful. But I'm always, I'm always on the road. I'm always offering retreats because it really inspires me to go to new places and and uh and with people and just have those experiences i saw your picture there at machu picchu we did a retreat there last two years ago oh that's that was awesome. amazing yeah i love, I lo- I love it down there mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and uh, if you're listening to this and you have a studio, I love to come and visit. I love to come and share the Satva Yoga practice with you. Wicked. Awesome. Well, thank Canmore. you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> no, just Canmore <laughs> Yoga Lounge. Um, thank you so much for yeah, your time, Yeah, Yoga Lounge. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. I hope. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for calling me, and uh, maybe we can do this some time in the future. Yeah, definitely. Good luck with uh, with your podcast. I'm, I'm really glad that you're doing this because I think that uh, I think that it's really important because a lot of people that are starting this uh, teaching don't have all the resources when it comes to the business side of it. I know I didn't when I came, and I still feel like I'm learning. I'm lucky that my fiance is a businesswoman, so she can help me out. But not everybody has a fiance with a business <laughs> background, I guess. So. It's great that you're doing this. Thank you so much for doing that. And uh, good luck. Good luck with it. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. All right. So there's the interview with Andrew. And if you want to learn more about him, you can definitely check out his website. There'll be a link on the show notes at www.mbomyoga.com. You can also find all the latest blog posts and the most recent ebook that I released up on the website at mbomyoga.com. There's a book that's on a short book. It's more of a workbook on how to get your first job as a yoga teacher. So definitely check that out. Also sign up for the newsletter at www.mbomyoga.com forward slash news newsletter. You can also join me on social media and Facebook and Instagram at Mastering the Business of Yoga. Now, as always, thanks so much for listening and namaste.